thank you mustafa and uh, for this wonderful introduction and i would like to thank bansi and the entire team from dicad for inviting me to speak here today this is a topic that i really love from the heart and we have recently been doing a lot of work in this area uh, more from the rssds point of view and where i'm coming from is the fact that gone are the days when we believe that you know manual working is the way to go there has been a huge sea change of the way now we approach patients uh, in terms of their care and monitoring and technology is making this entire transformation today uh, going forwards i'm sure that a lot of people are going to adopt technology and digital solutions which is going to make uh, care easier affordable and probably more structured uh the question that really comes is that can we predict an illness before it actually occurs and these are the points that we really need to look at that can we interpret data and monitor trends of an illness so that we can foresight any problem and then try and see whether we can take a predictive action against it so that we can you know have patients who are more healthy and stay within the goals that we really prescribe them to be at so what is the driver of you know patients who don't get control and the majority of the people that we really look at have a clinical inertia now this inertia can be from the patient's perspective from the healthcare professionals uh, perspective but let me look at it more from the patient's perspective that what makes the chronic disease so hard to accept and manage very often it could be a motivational problem where people feel defeated that they have a problem and they have to live with it for a long time and they have to continuously keep taking medication so there has to be a continuous motivation for them to do well also we do understand that diabetes is a problem that we cannot cure it is a it has a progressive character and very often we tell our patients that we need to keep the goals very stringent if we have to prevent any deterioration of the disease process itself and try and preserve as much of beta cells as possible we still consider diabetes as a taboo and very often our patients are very reluctant to share the fact that they have diabetes with people around them or within the family because it is considered as a stigma and more often than not a sense of permanence that you'll have to live with this problem in your entire life we also know that there is a very heterogeneous presentation which makes it very difficult at times to recognize the early features of diabetes or diabetes related complications so it it has to be a continuous monitoring that you need to do for the patient which will alert you to the possibility of diagnosis whether it is diagnosis of diabetes or diagnosis of diabetes related complications now there are certain hurdles that we see when we treat patients with diabetes and that is because a lot of our approach tends to become more glucose focused we don't look at the periphery around the glucose which patients come to us with and we know that majority of our patients don't come with only glycemic you know poor control but they have other associated problems which makes them at a risk for macrovascular complications so be it dyslipidemia be it weight be it hypertension smoking so many lifestyle problems and all these have to be addressed in totality and we shouldn't be so glucose centric in our approach which is a wrong way to look at the whole thing also we have got number of people who treat and if you see in our society patients have the options to go to their gps very often you know the relatives by their own experience and to treat we've got of course specialists we've got diabetes nurse educators dietitians coaches podiatrists and all these sort of make team which tends to have a overall sort of you know overview about the patient care so it is important that when you treat patients you have a proper teamwork and you need to have the required uh, talent in your team which will help the patient in a multifaceted manner so that you're not only looking at from the medical perspective but we are looking at from a holistic point of view a large part of a care gets compromised because patients are unaffording and they are not able to afford care uh, unfortunately for our patients we don't have a very strong public health system 
which can make healthcare affordable. And yet, people have to rely on private insurance or out of pocket uh, care. Uh, very little actually that comes in from the public health system. And this is where I think we need to strengthen and urge our policymakers to see that we can strengthen the, uh, the health, uh, public health care system so that more and more people are able to afford and get better quality care. What is the current challenges that we see in our Indian scenario? And this is something which is relevant to our own society. We are seeing a worsening of patient to provider ratios. So looking at the volume of patients that we've got in our country, and we know currently we stand at around 77 million population of patients with diabetes as per the idea, and we're projecting it to increase almost twice as much in the coming years. And given the fact our number of trained personnel to treat diabetes is not keeping pace with the exponential increase in the number of patients with diabetes. <laughs> also, there is a geographical barrier to accessing diabetes care and the healthcare provider burden has to increase if we have to get better quality care. More important is that we have to make care affordable. And unless we make care affordable, a lot of patients are going to fall off the curve and be sort of, you know, getting compromised care, which will put them at risk for the burden of complications. What is the worst thing is that when patients don't see an improvement in outcomes, they tend to fall off and they are not, they sort of lose their motivation to get good control. And we need to sort of at all points of time be very encouraging and monitoring them very closely to see how much are they able to comply with the treatment and see that they follow the treatment as advised by the HCPs. Now, this is going to be the outline of how I'm going to address my talk today that can digital health solutions help to address all these challenges that I really talked to you about and make it easier for both the patient and the HCP to you know, work out a combined uh, approach to better care in diabetes management. So we are going to look at the data management platforms, telehealth services, digital prevention program, mobile applications, social media, and cloud-connected glucose monitoring systems. And this probably will make the entire ecosystem, which will sort of help the patient in the approach to better care of diabetes. Now, let's start with some of the data management platforms. And we know that data today is extremely important, and data is a gold mine. Now, how does really data help us? As I said, that we need to be predictive. And unless we have a proper collection of data, we are not able to predict trends of an illness that is going to happen to us. And as an example, may I tell you that, okay, if you have somebody who's got a, let's say, an uh, a, a albumin creatinine ratio of about, let's say, you know, 300 uh, of 30 today, and the patient then develops an albumin creatinine ratio of, let's say, about 300, you know that something is going wrong with the kidney. Or for that matter, or let's say an A1C, an A1C patient has got about, let's say, 5.4, and his next visit, he's got 5.7, and then 6.1. Now, if you're not monitoring these trends, you're missing out the early recognition of trend towards pre-diabetes, where you can aggressively put lifestyle programs into place. So we just look at absolute values, and we don't look at trends of a problem, where we can have a prediction of a problem before it occurs. And where does this prediction actually come from? It comes from all the monitoring devices. So whether it's glucose meters, CGM devices, pumps, or for that matter, trackers. If you find that there is a gradual weight increase that's happening, you don't wait for the weight to really become a person to become obese before you start attacking. So uh, we know the old age adage that prevention of a, uh, of a weight gain is much easier than losing weight. So if we are able to track weight of a patient by various lifestyle measures, then obviously there's going to be an easier option to lose weight rather than wait for the patient to gain weight and then lose it, which is a very difficult prospect for the patient. It is important that ultimately we have a common ecosystem where we can do all these, you know, collect the data and interpret the data so that on a unified platform, we're able to come to conclusion and analyze the information, which then can be analyzed and interpreted by various the patients and the providers. And I'm going to, towards the end of my talk, 
talk to you about what now RSSJ is aiming at, and we are working on this entire project for the last two years to see how we can bring digital health and care and you know monitor data. And we're trying to see whether we can integrate it in one platform so that going forwards we may have a better system of care for the patients and we move beyond manual to more of a digital health which also the government of india today is aiming at yeah uh, if you must have read sometime back in the newspaper the ayushman digital health mission which has been introduced a very good scheme because we need to have a unified uh, health id which will give us access to the overall health of an individual now data management platforms how do they help it reduces the patient burden because a large part of a patient actually don't upload the data that comes from the various devices that we use so if we are able to integrate on one platform our clinical data monitoring data uh, uh feedback of what is happening to us given the intervention that we do for better control it is going to obviously be very valuable for a individual doctor to decide the plan of treatment for the patient so it is important that we try and integrate all this data together on one platform it is also going to reduce the provider burden so it doesn't have to look at multiple sources to get a particular data about a patient and once you are able to integrate all this on one data platform then obviously you look at the whole chart in front of you and you are able to come to a conclusion so although estimates vary multiple studies and key opinion leaders have suggested that majority of the providers although do not regularly download or review diabetes data but the platforms may make this downloading and reviewing the data easier and provide a faster help to providers to reduce the burden of managing such data and what does this ultimately lead to is improvement in clinical outcomes so if we are able to predict the glucose trends and motivate the patient in timely intervention then obviously in their diabetes care regimes we can make the necessary adjustments and you know provide them information so that the patients can then sort of you know change course and take action early enough before he lands up in some kind of a problem today is the world of telehealth and the pandemic has really uh, told us the power of telehealth earlier in our practices the patient would be extremely reluctant to speak to a screen and with the platforms uh, with the with the pandemic we have now come to realize the power of collaboration through telehealth uh through telehealth the patients and providers can exchange health information and today we have got very powerful platforms which have been structured so beautifully where patients can be anywhere in part of their country and yet have the best talent to treat him uh, similarly for the doctors also if you look at our individual clinics it was very difficult to get trained personnel and you probably may not have a diabetes nurse educators uh, you may not have proper nutritionists podiatrists exercise physiologists all rolled in or it may be unaffordable for a doctor to employ now given the fact that you can employ talent from any part of the country it is easier that it can the the, the online platforms become an extension of the clinic and you can have talent from any way giving advice to your patient uh, this is the power of uh, today telehealth and given this today you may have patients any part of the country and yet you can afford you can provide treatment to that patient so while we are integrating care we are also making it within the reach of any patient any part of the country and now we have governed by specific rules the government of india released the telemedicine guidelines on the 25th of march which has given us some kind of a structure as to how telehealth needs to be carried out and this is from the safety of medico legally uh implications for an individual doctor so going forwards i think telehealth is going to be an important component of a clinical practice uh, just as we do from a in in a clinic practice the telehealth is going to be an extension of a clinic and you'll find that a lot of patients and this is probably going to bridge the gap of the provider and the patient you know the 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 disparity that we have got in terms of numbers so with the telemedicine platform we may be able to bridge this gap more easily now 
how does really telehealth services help us? It would probably help in reducing the time and cost because the patient need not spend time to come to a particular individual clinic, wait there, spend hours, and you know that could be sort of productivity time loss, as well as he will save out in terms of his travel costs and other things. So it becomes more productive to have a distance uh, consultation. It also, as I said, that you can get better uh, opinions and a lot of people seek second opinions and complex interpretations, which then becomes much easier for an individual to seek better uh, health care. And it may sort of make it easy for remote patients in remote areas to get consultations with high quality doctors who have probably, you know, when complex problems are there and you find that you're not really been able to get the best out of uh, the consultation, you may be able to upgrade that to people who are more better trained and get better care. So it may give you access to a lot more doctors who can help you in quest for better, better health. Uh, critical care monitoring is possible where transfer is not possible. So very often in the deepest areas of a country, where transportation becomes a limitation, you may find that telehealth may be the only solution and yet the patients may be able to get uh, the required care and consultation that they see. And also, uh, it has become easy to monitor patients at home and ambulatory monitoring. If I look within the city of Pune, today the expansion of Pune that has happened, and if you look at distance areas of within Pune, there are times when people require almost about an hour or an hour and a half to reach my clinic. And they tend to sort of uh, postpone the visits because of lack of time. Now, these patients may end up either losing out on consultations or may probably be in consultations. And you do find that often when patients come to you, the evencies may be quite high because they've missed their consultations in between, where as a healthcare provider, we would have picked up early signs of uh, deterioration and help the patients to see that they can correct their courses. So telehealth is come to stay and it is going to be an important uh, component of our future consultations with the patient. Now, if you do have, uh, if you have to move to uh, sort of, you know, more of digital health care, then you need to have the, uh, the backbone for it in terms of the applications. And today with this level of sophistication that we've got, We've got a lot of sophistication in the platforms which serve the patients uh, for consultations. Now, as I said, that prediction of an illness is very important. And why does prediction help us? Because it helps us to prevent diabetes or prevent complications. And this, if you look back from history, from the Landmark Diabetes Prevention Program, the focus was on lifestyle coaching and education, and that made all the difference in the outcome of the patient. And the focus was on weight loss, healthy eating, exercise, and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. Now, given this, just transfer this on the digital platform. And today we've got apps which do precisely this and gives the importance to lifestyle changes. If you look at all the guidelines that we've got for treatment of diabetes, what it focuses on is lifestyle, metformin, and then trust. But in this entire sort of conundrum, you find that lifestyle finds a very little role in our clinic when we come to advising our patients. So all these platforms which are looking at weight loss, healthy eating, exercise, and change behavioral change have now got a very high level of importance. And the patients can do this simultaneously along with your you know, care that you provide the patient. Because we do know that a large part of our Improvement in A1C depends on lifestyle and behavioral changes. And this is what we really need to sort of encourage. We see that there are sort of, you know, studies which have looked at the impact of digital prevention program. And you can see some of these studies over here. One of them being that Omada Health, this was just an example. Omada Health Prevention Program reported a two-year data which demonstrated that participants who complete prevention program lost an average of 4.9 percentage of the initial body weight after one year, reduced A1C by 0.4% at one year or 0.46 after two years. And you find there are a number of examples of such sort where there has been an impact of digital prevention program on a patient's different parameters, whether it be the weight, 
be it A1C, be it mental health, be it lifestyle change, so many other aspects of it. Uh, one of the tools that we really employ for effecting health change are the mobile applications. And you see there are a number of apps now you've got, if you just open up the app store, whether it is Android or iOS, you find that there are apps for nutrition, physical activity, glucose monitoring, insulin titration. And what this ultimately does is tries to guide an individual person how he should behave and you know monitor himself as well as effect treatment. Uh, very often, busy doctors don't have enough time to dedicate to patient education. And, you know, a consultation can be very quick and you may just give the patient a prescription. But that doesn't help the patients in terms of better care. So it is good if you can integrate the patient's, you know, physical consultation with an online digital app where he can get information a validated information about nutrition, physical activity, and he's able to do his glucose monitoring and report back to you so that you can take effective decisions. And at times when the patient finds it, uh, or the individual doctor finds it difficult to titrate the insulin, then these titration apps may come very handy in those sort of situations. And on the right side of the slide, you'll see some of the examples of apps that we've got today, which precisely do all these things at the end point. Uh, we also have eight systems. So, you know, these are sort of closed loop systems that we've got from the CGM, insulin pumps, computer control algorithms, and of course, communication between the CGM and insulin pumps on individual patients. And this is so useful so that patients, particularly the insulin pumps have become a boom, whether it's for type one patients or patients who have frequent hypoglycemias, patients who are reluctant to take injections, and the insulin pumps come very handy and particularly patients with hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia unawareness, you find that you put the patient on a CGM and probably an insulin pump, which has got a sensing mechanism, then you may find that the incidences of hypoglycemia may drop and the A1C may be better controlled. And you find that that makes all the difference in the outcomes of a patient who's got diabetes. But they are obviously... Uh, there have been a huge amount of data for validation about these mobile apps and what it has shown, it improves clinical outcomes, it reduces the provider burden and overall sort of reduces the economic burden for the patient by, redu by reducing the emergency room visits and hospitalizations. I'm going to come to the uh, next section and that's the impact of social media today because all our lives today are controlled by social media. And social media is a double-edged weapon. While it does have information which can be of very use, it can also con contain a lot of junk and may have misinformation. And it is important for an individual to segregate the two because uh, it is important to see where the source of information is really coming from and how authenticated it is. So you do have patient blogs, podcasts, with, through which patients can document their own experiences with diabetes. And there's no better learning for a patient than from hearing a fellow patient of how he overcame challenges. Uh, the other things are, of course, online diabetes forum through which patients can pose questions and seek public comments and comments in the public setting for peer feedback. But this is very important to see where this information is coming from, because there's always a chance that misinformation can creep in and patient can be misled. You've got to be very careful about Facebook, Twitter, and all these platforms, and of course, all information sharing sites that you see where news and advices are given. So you have to be very, very vigilant and probably consult your care provider on the authenticity of the information that you get before you implement it in your day-to-day -day, uh, day -day care. I'm going to come to the last part of my talk, and there's a cloud-connected glucose monitoring systems that have now come to stay. And it is very useful because it gives both the patient and the caregiver a real-time view about your glucose levels, which then affects early care and changes of your dose titrations. The challenge of manual logbook always remains because it is difficult and time-consuming to analyze the data. Very often it is very badly written and there could be absolutely illegible data that you may see there. Patients can lose their logbooks in the bargain, lose the information, 
they may omit high blood glucose values or they may just fabricate the data and at times patients who are not literate may not be able to document that data uh i want to introduce you to the roches integrated personal diabetes management i'm just going to take a couple of minutes to drive uh, to tell you about this it is helps the patient to manage complex uh, complexity of managing diabetes to improve time and rate it collects integrates and analyzes disease relevant data points to support hcp treatment decisions to delay the to delay the disease progression and it moves beyond selling hardware to offer integrated solutions and here they integrate the physicians the caregivers the peers nurses hospitals and what they really look at is blood glucose measurement the medications physical activity diet and lifestyle and all this sort of becomes an entire system by which a patient is able to get a better care platform uh, i'm just going to take a minute to talk about this this is a structured assessment and training uh, based on which you decide the therapy of course uh, important part of the decision making is how the slbg is collected and relate to you and uh, this tells us of course the glucose profiles in a day to make a more informed decision about treatment and what is driving an a1c to not getting control because obviously there are times when the patient comes to you with a good fasting and post prandial yet you find that the a1c is high and you don't know what is causing this a1c to really drive the the limits of you know beyond control and of course there can be a proper documentation of the data that is being given to you so that you are able to process it properly and this comes from the newer generations uh, you know data collection systems of glucose monitoring that we have got which is connected to the i cloud so the moment the patient is collecting the data it is transferring the i cloud and it comes to you in forms of trends or in sort of systematic analysis uh, this has helped us very much towards personal management and treatment towards effectiveness of assessment so let me sort of you know uh, tell you the benefits of integrated personalized diabetes management in this study 907 patients were enrolled 51 practices were looked at over 12 month period of time and they looked at the assessments of needs the structured therapy and adapted glucose monitoring the documentation which was structured collaborative review personal treatment and assessment of effectiveness and what they did show in the end was there was significant improvements in the a1c higher patient and physician treatment satisfaction rates increased patient adherence when compared to the glucose uh, to the compared to the control group and this paper was presented in the drcp uh, the benefits of integrated personal diabetes management is of course that uh, there is reduction of mortality and additional quality of life years the ipdm patients gain 0.52 life years and 0.287 quality of life years per patient the rate reduction of first myocardial infarction from 72% reduced to 15.7% and there was a reduction in hypoglycemia reduced by 8% in the ipdm group uh the foundational benefits were that effective and efficient processes so there were more frequent and timely therapy adjustments faster and more accurate decision making greater clinical effic efficiency and greater clinical satisfaction what does this relate to improved clinical outcomes so there was a reduced clinical inertia improvement in a1c with no increase in hypoglycemia reduced glycemic variability and better postprandial control and this ultimately led to a stronger hcp and patient collaboration with a higher treatment satisfaction improved adherence and thus enhanced patient understanding and improved patient empowerment for decision making i'm going to just end up by saying that from the rss dia today the next step that we have really taken is to do something what we call as a data grid diabetes data grid and this is on lines of what we have existing cancer grid of the country and we have already developed the data grid for diabetes because what we did realize is a paucity of data that we've got from our own indian population and we don't have adequate data gathering mechanism to predict outcomes or predict care and we have now structured an entire data grid by which we should be able to help every care professional to analyze the indian population data 
and this will help us to develop indian uh, india related guidelines as to what we should be structuring care and have therapeutic goals for a patient so look out for this space in the coming months because we are going to probably put this out in public domain and each one of us can be part of this data grid where we can harness and contribute to the data in the data grid and probably make more meaningful outcomes for our patient thank you very much for your patient listening